All right, we are back. I'm excited to be here with Kelly. Tell us who you are and what you do, my friend. Hi, I'm Kelly Freed, and I work as a PM on the vision services uh, that we bring to you through Cognitive Services. Fantastic. So it's all about vision today, is that right? All about vision. Fantastic. So why don't you describe what computer vision is and then maybe get into some of the announcements and then I want to see like how this stuff actually works. Yeah. So vision services make it easy for you to um, process images and get analytics out of that. So when you have these large amounts of images, how do you know what's in them? How do you take actions on them? So we have a suite of vision services and we have some major updates. Uh, Lance talked a little bit about some of them earlier. Um, our biggest update is containers. Um, we have two vision services that are now available in containers. Um, that's face and recognize text through um, computer vision. I see. So what does that actually, what does that mean? So face detection is basically give me a box around all the faces? Yeah. So it's actually face detection and face recognition. Oh, so I we see. can detect uh, all the faces in an image, tell you a little bit about those faces, um, some general information for you. It would be, say this is a man with a beard. Currently he's happy because we're talking about cognitive of services. Of course, of course. Um, and then since I know you and we would train the model to know you, it would say this is Seth and he's, um, I'm yeah. tallish, yeah, <laughs> but not super tallish. Exactly. Is tallish one of the attributes in your vision Unfortunately, service? Unfortunately, you can't tell tallish from a face. Oh, but if you could, weird. we would have it. I, I know I can, <laughs> in you know, generally just with the face, yeah. I can tell. So Lance talked about containerization. Can you describe a little bit what it means to yeah. run a containerized version of vision? Yeah. So containers are helping give flexibility and control to our customers. Mm -hmm. So we have these customers who are building large scale solutions on top of our vision services. Mm -hmm. And now they're able to take these solutions that they've built once and repeatedly deploy it, whether it's on the cloud, on premises, in your customer's deployment system. Mm -hmm. And no matter what hardware you're on, it's gonna work the same. If, it's, if you're running the web version that you have right now, it's gonna run the exact same as if you have the, the on-premises version using I containers. See. And so it's basically exactly the same service, whether mm -hmm. it's in the cloud or on premises. Is yeah, what you're exactly. And a lot of these, especially with vision, we're giving you the building blocks of vision. And a lot of times you build analytics on top of that. So you might say, uh, I want to recognize all the men of a certain age. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I want to do something. Mm -hmm. And as we improve our services, we update them regularly. And if you, have built on top of it, you want to make sure that the updates we give you and the improvements we make actually work with the system you have. I see. And so now by having containers, when I deploy, I control how I deploy it, I, deploy, I control how often I deploy it. I can then pull down the container, test it in my dev environment, and then redeploy it into my production and into all of those production environments and make sure that I'm giving a stable solution to my customers. I see. So you can actually, like for example, use Azure pipelines to pull stuff in mm -hmm. directly from the ACR, or the Azure Container Registry, mm -hmm. and everything can be a repeatable software process that you're used to. Exactly, exactly. And so we'll still continue to give you these updates that we you've grown to know and love from Cognitive Services, but you actually have the control of when that update hits your service. I see. So another question that I think is important is, when would a customer decide or choose to use containers? Yeah, so there's a ton of different reasons you would use containers. Um, so there's, anytime you're running things, you need to run things on premises uh, or at the edge. So let's imagine you're a company and you're processing business documents and you're using one OCR, or you're using our recognized text service right now to uh, process these documents. You have images of them, you wanna know what's in them. And then let's say you have some departments that have more sensitive data, mm -hmm. and that sensitive data has to stay on premises. Mm -hmm. Those departments are falling behind in the technical advancements that the rest of the company is getting. And as you said earlier, you have to hire these people to just sit and read through documents that could be doing more valuable work, and those departments still have to spend human time doing that work. And now, by running it on premises, those people can be spent um, elsewhere and you can use on-premises solutions. I see. And so when, we're, when I'm looking at this, is there, is there a benefit speed-wise running it locally versus in the cloud? Let's just say I have like a semi-connected environment. Yeah, that's the next huge reason we would see. So think of another department that 
the documents can go to the cloud, but maybe you're on a field research um, or you're in a department store. Mm -hmm. And we've all used spotty Wi-Fi on a department store. Yes. It's, it's not the best. And images aren't small. Images are big. And when you have large amounts of them, it takes, it just brings down your entire network. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to send a large amount of images through the network, especially in spotty mm -hmm. conditions, you just couldn't use our cognitive services previously. And so now you can run those locally and just send small packages every so often um, to Azure. That's awesome. So you, you did mention, like, here's the question I have, and I'm sure everyone's wondering this, but mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask it because I can feel someone out there wondering this. Is, are, there really, are they really the same service, the one running in the cloud? Like mm -hmm. if I was in a call, computer vision, yeah. and then I was to call the same service that like face detection in the container, is it exactly the same service? Yeah, so previously, the, it's the same service. You use the same keys, the same code that you wrote to call it, it's, you're going to be able to use again. The same code that you wrote to analyze the results, again, you can use again. The only difference is how it's being deployed. So previously mm -hmm. at the cloud service, you would send your data over your network up to our service. It would process it. We would delete that, ser that data. And then we would send usage data to the back end. Mm -hmm. um, now when you deploy it, it's the exact same service. It's just deployed locally. So you send that data locally, and we just send the usage back to Azure. So let me see if I understand. Like, Because I know the usage is important because mm -hmm. We want to, like, this is obviously is, someone needs to get billed for this. Obviously, there's like 40,000 free calls or something yeah. that you get a month. But let's just say I go over that. What if, what if I'm a clever guy and I, I disconnect my network? Is it mm -hmm. still going to work without the usage data? So we want to make sure that customers who have this spotty Wi-Fi, not, it doesn't turn off every time it, your Wi-Fi goes out for a second. But... Um, we also need you to stay connected to Azure. So we have a little bit of a grace period, but other than that, once you've passed that grace period, we stop serving calls until you've reconnected. Um, and just as you said, you get a bunch of free calls. Um, every service has a free tier. Mm -hmm. The free tier still applies to these containers. So you can use the same free key, deploy it locally, and you get the same amount of free usage that you would get in the cloud. I see. So it's it's basically you basically lifted and shifted down to a exactly. container, which is usually we lift and shift up to the cloud, but you're lifted and shift down so people can take advantage if they need to locally. Exactly. Exactly. That's awesome. So here's a question: How do I get started? Like I I, I feel like we talked we've talked a lot about like this is really cool, this is great. Even when the connection is severed, it will still work up to a certain tolerance. How do I do this now? Yeah. So for vision services. You need to sign up to get access. And so you would go to aka.ms slash vision containers preview. Mm -hmm. And this, here you'll tell us a little bit about yourself and what you want to use containers for. Once we review it, we'll send you access to the private ACR. And you can then sign up and start um, using it. So what you'll do is um, you're, to run it, you need a few commands. Okay. So after you pull it down, you slide in, you'll pull it down, and then you'll do a Docker run. The first thing you need to do is accept the EULA. This just says that you're accepting um, the terms of use, that you're using the technology as. So I'm looking at this, and you are literally just Docker pulling something from an ACR. Yeah. And then just Docker running it. And you'll use an API key, and you get an API key similar to how you've always gotten an API key. Mm -hmm. um, you'll go to your Azure portal, mm -hmm. and you'll create a new resource, search for face, and once it loads, yeah, and then there you go. You can start with just that key. And as I said, you can use the exact same key, so I already have a face key, mm -hmm. and so I just use that key to deploy this container that I have running right now. Holy cow, so this is literally exactly the same. Exactly the same. The only difference is now you have an extra step where you're pulling the container locally. Exactly. And there's one more thing that you need is the billing endpoints. So this is the only difference is instead of calling the cloud with the whole um, picture, right? the whole picture, you have to specify what billing endpoint you're going to use. So you would go back to your key. And in the overview, 
we have endpoint. So you can just copy that endpoint, put it into your Docker run, and you're up and running. And that's all it takes. Just three parameters, and you're up and running with that. Holy Docker. cow, Kelly. We got like a whole 45 minutes left. I mean, it's that simple. It's that simple. So uh, the question I also have is that, I mean, I'd love to see it working locally. Is it, is it yeah. literally just the same? Can, can I do it like, because I know with cognitive services, you can just upload a picture onto the main website. Is there something like that as yeah, well? Yeah, so we wanted to make it just as easy for you to test locally as you're able to test online. So if you go to your local host, I have it listening to port 5000. Mm -hmm. If you go, you can um, see that the container is now listening. Mm -hmm. So if you have any issues with running, this is where you'll see it. When mm -hmm. you go to local host, it will say there's an error and it will tell you what that error is. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can go to the service API description. And you're running this locally right now? This is all running locally. I could disconnect my internet for a, a period of time and it would still keep running. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So these are the exact same calls that you would make in the cloud and it tells you how to make them and the information about it. So let's try it out. So this also lets you try it out and make sure that everything is right. responding the way you expect. So this is our face detect service. And I'll say I want to get all of the information. And I'll Star, nice. <laughs> we like to keep it yeah. easy. And I will put a picture of this runner. And and so while it's while it's executing, it's basically exactly the same thing you were doing before, except now you're calling the local host. Yeah. So this is the exact um, call that you're making. And as you can see, I'm making pretty much the exact same call that I would make. The only difference is I'm calling the local host instead of the online version. Mm -hmm. So when you're making that change in your code, all you have to do is make a config change that says instead of calling that web location, call this local host lo location. And then you get the exact same information in the exact same format as you're That's expecting. That's cool. I was literally doing something with this last night because I wanted to draw the actual boxes around people's faces. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the same the same yeah. thing that I had before, which exactly. is was pretty awesome. So this is Face. You mentioned there was two. Is there two services that yes. you can do in containers with Vision? So we have Face, and then we also have recognized text from Computer Vision. Mm -hmm. So um, recognized text allows you to uh, it allows you to read text that are in, in images. So for instance, we have this image here, and when you run recognized text over it, it will tell you where in the image that text is, what the angle is, and what it says. That's and crazy. as you can see in this image, it's not, it's not like a perfectly scanned document. Our recognized text engine is really good at recognizing things when there's uh, shadows on it. Like if you look at the N and when, the, the background is almost the exact same color as the text. And it's not even a document. It's like some sign someone took a picture of randomly behind a fence. Exactly. And so this also works on documents. So if you're trying to empower your business to run document understanding quicker, you can use this. But also if you're running a camera on the edge and you need to know what buses are coming in, you can actually read the bus numbers as they come through the checkpoints. And um, you can do that all on the edge if you have multiple cameras, multiple entryways, now you can run all of that on the edge without killing your network. That's really cool. Like I can imagine scenarios where, for example, you have a car park. I'm saying it the British way for, for everyone there in the UK. You have a car park and when people drive in, right, you can basically, let's just say they're part of your subscription for mm -hmm. parking, you can literally take a picture of their... Yeah at the edge, there in, in the actual the car park, and then you don't need, they'll just charge them later. You were there for three hours. Yeah. You came in at this time and left at this time. Here's a picture of your car coming in. Here's a picture of your car leaving. And all of this can happen at the edge, which is pretty cool. And instead of sending a, multiple video streams, because most car par parks have multiple entries, instead of sending multiple video streams to the cloud, you're sending, when I see a car that matches this description, send just the time to the, and then you're not killing your IoT edge with, yeah, with tons, the ton, of calls. tons of calls. Yeah, tons of calls. So let's get into like the specifics of what, because you mentioned face and text for the containers. What specific things can you do with face and what mm -hmm. specific things can, scenarios can you do with recognize text? Is it just basically, if there's text, it'll find it, it'll tell you where, and it'll tell you the angle? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so for recognized text, as we said, we can use it both 
for empowering businesses to do things quicker and understand what documents are coming in, whether that be receipts or emails or memos or forms that you're getting from your customer and they're sending them in, you can understand and see what's in those and process them a lot faster. And you can also um, do it on these edge deployment or these edge scenarios where you're trying to understand the text in the world around you. I see. Um, face, we hear a lot of services or a lot of scenarios where you want to understand what your customers are looking like. So if you have a, a device that's out there in the world and you want to see who's interacting with that device, what are their demographics? You want to feed that back to your marketing team, let them know what is their sentiment as they're interacting? What are the demographics of the people interacting? How long did they stay? Um, did we see the same people come back multiple times? You can start to get all of that information by using the face service. For sure. Um, and now that you're on the edge, face is one where having multiple cameras running at different locations is hugely powerful. Yeah. And now you can get a full view of your surroundings and who is where in your surroundings. And that's that's cool because like, like it's all within the same router, right? And yeah. that usually when I'm looking at networks, it's like if it's in the same router boundary, the calls are gonna be super fast to each other. Exactly. And you'll be able to like literally process video feeds and then the service will say, two people here. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to trigger other things to happen on top of that. Yeah, and so we can run real time in the cloud if you have a great network bandwidth and if you only have one camera and you're not Mm -hmm. killing your network to try and get it to us, but now you can actually run real time in multiple cameras over whether it's a stadium, a store, a facility, whatever it is, you can run all of these cameras at the same time. And that's, I don't know, it feels like you strategically chose the two vision problems that you would want to do the most to start. I mean, did you have some input on this? Yeah, so we've been working with customers from the beginning with this. And so these are the two services that we heard the most that they want them running on the edge. And that being said, that doesn't mean we're stopping here. Right. We're still working with customers. We're still seeing what other vision services you guys need running at the edge and you want at the edge. Fantastic. So is there anything else about containers that you want to talk about? Because I also feel like maybe people don't know anything about computer vision or, or custom vision. Maybe there's some other things, but is there anything else you want to talk about with containers? Um, just reiterating how easy it is to use and how much it empowers new scenarios that you might have thought were previously not possible with computer vision. Awesome. And so again, uh, I, I, the demo was super short. It pull the container, put in the keys, tell it where the endpoint is, and you're off to the races. You just start the Docker container. That's really cool. I might try that this afternoon, actually. Yeah. And if you are at home, you can try it today you because try it at lunch. I feel like you have because you have <laughs> forty thousand free calls that you can just have right now. Yeah. Pulling the container. Yeah. No excuses, people. I'm just saying. Okay. So what are the other vision scenarios that we can do non-container? Yeah. So we've talked about face. We have four major um, services in under vision. Yeah. Um, video indexer, which takes videos and gives you a ton of information about what's in that video. Okay. Computer vision, which includes recognized text, but it gives you all the information you could want about an image. Mm -hmm. um, face we've already talked about, and custom vision. So if we go a little bit deeper, um, computer vision lets you analyze everything you need to know about an image. So it gives you what are the objects in the image? What are the attributes about this image? So this one's outside. This one has people. They're happy. Mm -hmm. It's summer. Um, you'll understand all of this from computer vision. You can also find out that this is a real image and not a drawing. You can understand that this isn't clip art. Um, and then we also have the ability to recognize celebrities and landmarks. So say this image was not these people, but maybe someone we actually mm -hmm. know or yeah. who are famous. You would actually know who they are and where they're located in the image. So I think the real question, by the way, we're taking questions online, so please put the questions in. The real question is how, and this is super important, how do we get included in the 200,000 celebrities? Like, could there be 200,001? I mean, I'm just spitballing um, here. We actually are always growing our celebrities. Um, Seth, I'm sure we could add you. I don't count as a celebrity, but I know people who might think that I'm a celebrity, like my mom and then yeah. my dad maybe. Yeah. and. 
as long as you're okay with it, we just want to, don't want to get too big. And then you say, stop knowing me. Yeah, right. And I, come sure, on, that's back right. off a little bit. And that's cool because you might, again, you might have people like, because we talked with Lance about brand recognition, also with Vision. Imagine having a celebrity and your brand in there and they say something negative. It's like, holy cow, man. Seth really doesn't like Cheetos today. They need the brand police going to need to call me and be like, why not? Yeah, exactly. Right. Or you can say on the more positive side, mm -hmm where what marketing campaigns with my logo and a celebrity had the most clicks mm -hmm. which celebrities should we be targeting to advertise with because those drum up the most market and see that actually makes more business sense value than my cheeto <laughs> example which is kind of cool right because you yeah. might be you might have a celebrity and a, they're promoting a brand and then you can follow click throughs and the picture that they put up and that, that actually makes more sense too. And you can do it with not only your brand but you could say who are my competitors um, mark advertising with and what are the click throughs that they're getting on those. Wow, that's amazing. So what other, what other features are there available? So um, you can, so computer vision also has the ability to caption um, images. So it will give you the ability to give, have a human sentence that uh, supports four different languages and um, this is great for accessibility or to get deeper understanding. So a sentence gives you more structure than you would see in tags. So it'll tell you things like next to or um, other deeper understandings that you m might w want from mm -hmm. computer vision. So is this a hard thing to use? Is there like an example somewhere? It's going to go to a website and just try it out? Yeah, so you can go to um, azure.com slash cognitive services mm -hmm. and find the vision page and we just as simple as it was to call face it's just as simple to call computer vision you send the image you tell us that you want to analyze the image and we give you back in a json everything you need to know about it awesome so we talked about computer vision i also saw what else was there so there's custom vision okay. so custom vision lets you customize and extend the existing pre-trained models okay. um so Let's go over to Custom Vision. Okay. So Custom Vision, what it does is I can put a little bit of my data up here and um, train a model that uh, tells me more about the images, but specifically what matters to me. Okay. So this has classification or tagging, which our pre-trained models also do. Um, and as we were talking about the power that you get from that hybrid cloud, Custom Vision allows that as well. So all classification models can be exported to containers, iOS or Android. Cool. We also have object. Hold on, that went really fast. Like, there's a because yeah. you said that really fast. That there's a way to because yeah, right so now I was thinking it was just like a, I have to call the service. You're saying I can download the model and run it locally. Yeah. So first, um, you would create a model. But let's say I'll pull up a model I already have. So let me look for a classification model. Okay. So. If mm -hmm. um. so, if you go to like I, I remember this because the site yeah. just basically changed. If you go to the yeah. gears, I think there is a way to like the green gears. Is it? Oh yes. Sorry, this is why we haven't trained yet because we mm. don't have enough images. I see. <laughs> That's the problem here. So if we had the had trained this model, mm -hmm. what you'll get is a icon that allows you to export mm -hmm. and that export allows you to once you say export we'll ask you how do you want it exported do you want it in ios android or a linux container wow. and then once you click it it gives you everything packaged the model and the python package so that you can deploy it and that's just it's this is cool because i mean basically when we're doing ai you, you you're spending all this time basically coming up with really good numbers in a network and then you put that into a file and then you put that out. You can actually download it and run it, run the models locally if you want. Exactly. And so when you're building these hybrid solutions with a pre-trained, you can now still extend those with custom vision and have that same hybrid experience. Awesome. So what is it like to train a custom vision model? Can you step yeah. through what that so looks what like? What you would do is upload some images. Mm -hmm. As we just saw, this one doesn't have many. Yeah. So you add images and you would just say what those images are. Mm -hmm. And so you would give it a tag. So I might upload 20 images and put cat or um, business card mm -hmm. or document mm -hmm. or um, we also hear things that aren't what's in the image, but what type of image is it? Is this a 
product image with a white background, or is this an action shot marketing image? So I can easily filter between them. I um, see. And so you, you upload them, you tag them, and then you train. And then you hit this green button to train. It takes about two minutes to train. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get a performance analysis. Let me pull up the one that I had. I know it has data mm -hmm. and <laughs> show you. So um, this is object detection, but both object detection and uh, classification will give you these precision and recall mm -hmm. numbers on your data. So it tells you, with the data you've tr given us, this is how good your model is going to be. Mm -hmm. And so from here, you can start digging into the data to continuously iterate and build a better model. I see. So you probably need more. Generally, I've found that you just got to give it more pictures. More pictures, more diverse pictures, um, making sure that every type of diversity is covered completely. That's cool. That's um, cool. So we have classification, but we also have object detection. And that gives you not only um, what's in the image, but where it is. And it doesn't tell you what's in the whole image, but what might be in a certain area of the image. Right. Um, and as Lance said, we've now launched a special <coughs> type Excuse of object me. detection, including logos. Mm -hmm. So this is a Microsoft logo detector. And as you can see, these are not good images of the Microsoft logo. No. These are the types of images that you would get if, for instance, I were to walk around campus and take pictures of the Microsoft logo, because right. that is exactly what happened here. And you get these blurry images that were taken with in a- In the rain, mostly. In the rain, because yeah. it's Seattle, with a really old phone, because I haven't updated mine. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and so you get these poor images, but yet, with the general object detector, you had OK <coughs> results. Excuse but when me. we train it with the logo domain, we end up getting significantly better results. And I you can start see. to recognize logos with really high precision. So we can test this one out. So here is a hat that I took a picture of, the Microsoft logo. Mm -hmm. And it'll process it. And within a few seconds, you'll see what the results were. And so we'll draw a little box for you. And this is what we see as a Microsoft logo with 91%. That's amazing because I'm not even kidding. Literally last night, I was trying to do a logo detection with just a regular general domain. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't doing as good. And so I didn't understand, like when Lance said earlier in one of the sessions, I didn't understand what you meant by logo detection. But you mean you've trained an entire domain mm -hmm. on just logo detection. So when you add your own images and the transfer learning happens, it's really good at it. Yeah, it really understands what a logo looks like and can zero in on those to mm -hmm. That's better. awesome. That's awesome. All right. And so again, to use this, it's basically just a call that you make mm -hmm. to the API. Is there, like, because I, one of the other questions that I have about, about custom vision, and maybe you can help me with that, like, do I have to do everything through the website? Is there a way I can, like, yeah. automate a lot of the image upload and tagging? Yeah. So we wanted everything to be, um, what you want, what you do here, you can all do through, uh, the APIs. So none of these are, there's no functionality on the website that isn't being run by public APIs. We actually just call all the public APIs and we put a nice UX on it so that it's easy to test. But everything you do here, you can do through automated calls. I see. And so like if you get a new logo picture and someone marks it up for you, you can actually put that into the process and retrain. And you can collect over a week or two a bunch of logo things that people have detected and then put it up there and then it'll just do it on its own. You can do that. Exactly. And so if you already have a pipeline where people are tagging data, you don't have to, re you don't have to migrate all of your taggers ov over to this system. Mm -hmm. You can just take the output of that system and put it through custom vision. Fantastic. OK. So um, here's another question I get, and maybe you can help me with this. How many pictures do I need to put up there in order for it to work reasonably well? Yeah, so we hear this all the time too. And unfortunately, there's not one easy answer. So something like a logo, the Microsoft logo generally always looks the same. It's four squares, always the same color. Sure. But if I'm trying to recognize chairs, the, a chair might look vastly different. There's sofa chairs, there's dining room chairs, there's a larger variety. So we recommend thinking about how different that category is, and then choosing the higher end or the lower end based on it. That being said, 20 to 50 images per category generally works. So something with a logo, maybe 20. Something like a character, maybe 50. 
I see. So if if you're putting like three images in, that's by the way, not going to work. Yeah, is, is there like a basic like threshold of how many you need to put yeah, in? Yeah. So as you saw on the last one when I tried to train it, it said you don't have enough images per category. Um, each classification and object have object detection have a minimum number, but we still recommend putting in right. more because so, the minimum number is about five. So if it's not working because you put five images in. That's on you. Yeah. I mean, you got to train the computer because it doesn't know of anything unless you tell it, right? You can think of it as like um, someone who's first learning what an object is. If you show them five images of it, they're not gonna they're not gonna be like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's the same for the for the computer. For the computer. So for those that are data scientists, what is it doing under the hood? Because I want people to have confidence that we're doing sensible things underneath. Yeah. So how is this actually working? So as you had said in the earlier session, most AI takes lots and lots and lots of data. And so we've already pre-trained a lot of these models with all the data that Microsoft has. And so we take those pre-trained models that we've optimized, and then we um, use transfer learning to classify the objects that matter to you. So the way it works is it runs our model to a certain point, and then the last several layers, we retrain with your data. I see, I see. So let me see if I understand this right, and you're the expert, you can help me. Basically, we've trained our own models on tons of data, like ImageNet or Coco, for example, mm -hmm. and which are standard data sets. If you were to go Google with Bing, you know, Coco or, or ImageNet, you would find a bunch of images, right? Yeah. And I, by the way, I am using Coco and I'm training it, and it's taking weeks to train. Yeah. So it's not something that you can do r really quickly. So once you've learned all these numbers, basically they're just numbers in a network, mm -hmm. what you do is you take their images and you retrain the model with all the good numbers and then add a couple of numbers at the top. Yeah, so pretty much what it says is, I've now seen enough of the world to know what a box is, to know what a scene, an outdoor scene looks like. But let me understand the things that matter to you. So um, like I said, when you're first training, um, teaching someone about the world, it's a lot easier to teach them what a chair is if they've seen a table and a house and people because it's just another item. Right. So we take all, we teach the computer all of these things by giving them a corpus of data and then we say, and now just learn this one extra thing. Awesome. So by the way, we're taking questions, so make sure they come online. So now that I've done, we've done this, let's go through a couple of other questions that I have about this because I've always wondered about this. You showed how to train logo detection. You basically upload it. You, you talked about domains as well. Yeah. What are those domains and when would I use one above another? Yeah. So, um, when we're training the system, as we said, we train it with a bunch of data and then you adjust it a little bit. So if we train it with all of the things in the world, um, it's a really, really wide array. But yeah. if we train it with just logos and we say, this is what a logo looks like, this is what a logo looks like, you're gonna, the system's gonna better understand what your logos look like. So it's just what is the data that we're putting in to give you a more localized view of I that. I see. So there's like a, when you think of a dom or the transfer learning, it's like you're pre-training stuff and then adding your stuff that's similar to it. Exactly. And when you say there's domains, you're basically training things on specific things and we know it does well on those things and then when you add your things, it should be okay. Exactly. So if you have a domain of squares, for example, which is kind of simple, you don't need, to need that, and then you give it another square that's a different size, then it's gonna be really good at it, but if you give it a triangle, it's not. Yeah. And that's when, so that's why when I was trying to do logo detection on the general domain, it was like trying to get triangles to work with squares. Exactly. Okay. Or we have, um, for instance, a retail domain. And so, I don't know about you, but when I take pictures of things in my house, they don't look as good as when I'm shopping online. Right. So. Well, I know, I, they do at my house. I mean, you saw the pictures I took <laughs> of Microsoft <laughs> right, logos. Right. They don't look like that at my house. And so, when I'm training something that has those glossy, retail-like images, it's better to use the retail domain and have it understand similar images. I see. All right, so we're getting some questions uh, uh, from uh, online. Martin says, very exciting about containers. Do you think there's significant customer demand for this? Yeah, so that's actually why we chose to go after containers is because we kept hearing, this is all great, but how do I run it here? How do I run it where my data is? Right. Or they'd say, I tried it, it's taking forever for my network to respond. What am, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. And so we've heard a ton from customers and we've actually started engaging with customers already and giving them access to these, early access to these containers and seeing how it works with them. And we, 
we have so many people who want to use these. Are people like you probably tested this with customers already? How has it been the reception? How's the reception been for this? Um, we've heard things like, I didn't think that this was possible. Um, we showed our leadership, and all they said is, when is this coming out in public preview? Mm -hmm. um, most of the questions we got were business questions of like, when does this come out? How, what's the next step? How do I go? Why have, hasn't yeah. this come out yet? We didn't actually get a ton of feedback of like, can you change this? Because it was just such a huge leap for them to be able to run it locally that it unlocked so many things that they'd already tried. It's kind of like that guy. I remember the first time they made internet work on the airplane. <laughs> it's kind of like that guy that got mad that the internet was spotty the first time <laughs> it ever existed on the airplane. Like yeah. now you- And everyone else was just like, oh man, it works. Yeah, and so you didn't get that. You got the, okay, what's next? We need this now. Yeah. Like they didn't even say they needed this now. They're already looking to what they wanted to do yeah. next. Cool. Uh, another question, can you train a model to count objects in an image? So object detection will tell you the location and it will recognize multiple individual ones. Um, if your objects are kind of overlapping, it's gonna have a difficult time keeping you at Mm -hmm. accurate number. So yes, we can give you the count of objects. How well it's going to work for your scenario really depends on what your scenario is and how much room for error you have. The, I, like, how about this? I'm on a factory floor mm -hmm. and on the assembly line, I always got to make sure there's seven cans of your favorite diet cola. Mm -hmm. That's something that, I mean, because it's, they're all going to be perfectly set. Exactly. That's going to work. That's going to work. Yes. Okay. Uh, but you are at a, uh, I don't know, your favorite kid's place and there's, there's like a you know those little balls that are colored and you jump in? It's not going to be able to count those because they're just all over each other. Or we heard, how, can you tell me how many uh, chickens are in the pen and what size they are? And we're like, no. I, I mean, th there's so many and they're running around and they're overlapping and it's, that's not... Yeah. I don't know that uh, I could do it looking at the images. It's basically like if I was, you were standing behind me or I, yeah, there's no way you can see. People. Okay, another question. Creating custom models for non-coders. I'm not very technical. Can I still be successful using this? Yeah, so um, every time we have somebody start working with us, the first thing we show them is custom vision because it gives it you an easy UX. You can work with it. It takes you maybe 15, 20 minutes to get your first model up and suddenly somebody who's never written a line of code has built an AI model, which um, it's admit, pretty remarkable. I've written many, many lines of code and I haven't built that many models. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's uh, like, like I started doing AI stuff like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the, when I saw this the first time, I was like, well, there goes like All that work five years of research that I did. Thanks for that, Kelly. Thank you. Me. Yeah. From Franj, can we create our own custom domains? As of right now, no, you cannot. Um, it takes so much data to create a domain. And when we create a new, new domain, we want to make sure that it, it works for a large amount of scenarios, that I it see. works for a lot of people. So when you have that much data, it's better to train the whole model. Right. So instead of saying, here's a bunch of data, and here's similar data, can you tell me what that similar data is? If you have that much data, you, you should, should train your own. Train your own. We have Azure Machine Learning Service for exactly. that. Exactly. You can use Databricks on Azure for that. For Martin, does Cognitive Services detect anything inside video content, faces, words, objects? Yes. So we also the fourth service that we didn't talk too much about. Oh yes, yet, let's get into is that. Video Indexer. So this actually just came out in GA recently. Um, having some trouble with the video responding, mm -hmm. but I uploaded the video you guys saw a little bit earlier, right before this session, mm -hmm. and. What it tells you is everything that's in the video. And this is multimodal, so it will tell you um, who is in the video. So mm -hmm. as you can see, we have Lance, who is oh. in the video multiple times. And he's it tells a, he's you the unknown number one. <laughs> exactly, and it tells you where he was in the video. Mm -hmm. And so Lance is unknown to our system, mm -hmm. but you and I know him, and maybe we have lots and lots of videos with Lance. I can now mark that this is Lance and know him throughout all of my videos. I see, so I, this is cool because like, a ton line would make a ton of videos. Exactly. If we pass something through Video Indexer, then what we're able to do is create like a pseudo search engine of like, how many times has Seth appeared? A shockingly high number of amount of times. <laughs> on a, or when has Kelly appeared and mm -hmm. talk about it. You can go ahead and do that. And you can not only say when does Kelly appear, but you can say when does Kelly appear and she's talking about 
cognitive services, about documents. So this is taking what I what was said throughout the video and telling you when that those keywords were said. I see. It also tells you what are we seeing. So tell me when Seth was having an interview outside about I containers. See. Um, or what brands? Let's talk about when Seth was talking about Microsoft, which is probably also a shockingly high number high of times. Number. <laughs> yeah, not and yeah, pretty high actually. And it looks like there's sentiment in there as well. Yes, there's sentiment of um, what is being said. So are these are we saying positive things or negative things in the video? So you can actually mix this with the keywords and who's saying it to say, when was Seth talking about Microsoft positively? When was Lance talking about a document understanding in a negative way and the challenges that come with that. Um, and all of the transcript of the video is actually, we. so this uses all of the cognitive services. So it will use speech to text to transcript all of it. And then you can translate that into, I think over 20 something languages. Holy cow. And it will put those back on the screen so that you can have automatic translation. And so for using this, I basically need to just upload a video and that's it? Yeah, so again, like, uh, custom vision, you have to have zero um, technical ability. Mm -hmm. um, I actually uploaded this this morning. Mm -hmm. I just click the upload button, pick my video, and then I get all of these insights. And as you were saying, I only have one video, so it won't do very good search, but I can search things like um, services documents. And it will tell me when, it will give me little clips of when this is happening. So if I had a large repository of videos, I can say, have much more complex searches and I can say, find me when this politician was talking to this other politician about something and oh, the man. sentiment was positive. And then when I'm creating these clips, I can pull all these pieces really quickly and make them instead of spending tons of time looking for them. It's amazing. It's like fact checking on steroids. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Okay, so to, to get started with this service is basically you just sign up. How much does this service cost? Is it per how much video you send up or is it for a query? How does that work? Yeah, so um, this is similar to all the other cognitive services. It is by how much usage you have. So how many videos, how many hours of video are you asking us to process? I see. Um, it's still a pretty reasonable rate. I can't remember off the top of my head, okay. but you can find it all on azure.com slash cognitive services. Okay, so now the other thing that I want to do is because we got about about 15 minutes uh, mm -hmm. left. Can we go through, because I know on the website you can actually try stuff out. Yeah. Can we go there and, and just show us, run through what each of the scenarios are that you can actually yeah. do with uh, computer vision? So if you went to azure.com slash cognitive, you can come down to vision. Okay. And so let's go to computer vision first. So um, this is the, if you send an image to the computer vision API, it will give you all of these different things. So description, this is the human sentence that we're giving you. Mm -hmm. So people waiting at a train station. And this can come to you in English, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, or Spanish. Oh, wow. Um, and it also gives you all of the words that we took in to, un to build this sentence. I see. Not all of them get into the sentence, but um, all of the input that the model used to come up Man, with the sentence. kids these days, like the amount of AI that goes into something like this is ridiculous. Like I, look, I started with NLP like 10 years ago mm -hmm. and we literally had to like count our own words. You know, it was crazy. So this is amazing. And it will also, this runs multiple services. As you can see, it runs tagging to get information, but it also runs celebrities. So I could say, it will not only say people waiting at a train station, but if there was a celebrity on this train station, it would say the celebrity waiting. At if I were to Photoshop station. a celebrity in, would it know that I did that? Um, it would probably say like, the celebrity standing on a train because yeah. it, it yeah. will be <laughs> nice. awkwardly placed. Nice. Um, but yes, it will be able to tell that celebrity. Um, so then tags is all of the things to tell you what what is in this image and what does this image look like. Sure. So there's a train, there's a platform, um, it's indoors, things like that. Um, we can give you some basic information. This is not clip art. There's a ton of information you get here. Um, yeah, and then. 
And you have a bunch of uh, images in there that you can check and you can upload your you can own upload. images. Yeah. So as you said, we have tons of free usage on um, of the free tier of each of the cognitive services. But if you don't want to start pulling down our SDK and running it yourself, um, you can just use the website to test out your images um, and get an idea of how accurate it is. Cool. Um, the next thing is reading text and images. So this is the recognized text that we had talked about a lot. And so as you see, we have all these different fonts, different shapes, different backgrounds, and still we're being able to read what is being said on the screen. That's cool. Um, and, and, it's, and, and I can see that it's not just like, like OCR, because OCR back in the day was it would only recognize like, like typed text, but this yeah. is recognizing all sorts of stuff. Does it recognize handwriting? Yeah, so this also recognizes handwriting. Um, so whether it's documents, handwriting, or um, unstructured text like this, we actually have a customer who um, uses this to understand product labels. I so see. people will just put product labels in, and what they said is, we kept trying to give it worse and worse pictures of the product label, and we couldn't get it to stop recognizing Gosh. what we were sending. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, an another question I have about uh, this, is it specific to just English? So we have two versions of OCR. We have one that, this new one that does really well on these blurry, hard to read images is English only. That being said, it's English characters. So if you're able to have some room for errors on accents, it can be used with other Latin character I see. languages. So it's, based, it's character based. Yeah. So um, I would definitely fully test it mm -hmm. on other Latin character languages, but sure. it can do okay on those. Cool. Um, the old OCR that is document focused can work in twenty something languages. That's cool. But yeah. this is like, this is not just regular. This is just OCR of like find something in a random picture. Yeah. Uh, Regular OCR is kind of more standard OCR. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. So those are more for like your business everyday needs of documents that are coming in. Awesome. So we have about 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. I want people to be inspired by what are some of the things that obviously that you can talk about that some customers are doing that makes this like a very powerful tool to, to add to your software arsenal. Yeah. So, um, like I how would I use this? today? What are some good ideas? Like, because people are probably looking at this and they're like, hey, I have this hammer. It's awesome. But where are the nails? So tell us about that. Yeah. So I think Video Indexer is a, a really strong example of how you can use these cognitive services to reduce costs in your business. Mm -hmm. So reduce the human cost of labeling things, reduce the human cost of people searching for the right thing by having a really great way of understanding what's in your images. We also, um, Anytime you have people taking text and putting it into another document, mm -hmm. the amount of businesses that take a form that is sent to them and then hand write all that information into yeah. another system is shocking, shocking, yeah. shocking to yeah. me. And so you can use our services to just do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, logo detection, which just came out, we have customers who want to know when is my logo showing up on things like Channel 9? Mm -hmm. And what, what time of day was that at? How many viewers did I have? What was the impact of that? So that they can start analyzing um, what their market presence is. And that's something that actually wasn't possible before. Because the size of the amount of videos that go on in the world, you can't hire enough people to watch all of them I see. and tag all of them. Of course. And so having a system like logo detection allows you to run it over all of this large amount of data to understand that. And, and that's pretty amazing. So here's another question uh, that I had regarding containers. So for the container stuff, is there like a separate container for each, for like face and OCR? Is it a different container or is it the same container? Yeah, it's separate. So we, one of the things when we were talking to customers early on was that they wanted to run these further and further out in the edge. And so we don't want you to have to pull this giant computer vision mm -hmm. service that has 10 different services inside of it and I does see. all of these things so that you can read a document. We want you to just have the smallest container for what you need so that it runs the most efficiently. How, how big are these containers, if I can ask that? Yeah, so 
they're the the size of the container isn't that big. It's how much does it take to run it. I see. So all of these are x64 CPU um, running containers, mm -hmm. and um, recognize text. We recommend a two core system with about eight gigabytes of um, memory. Okay. Um, face recognition you can run with less. So it would be one core and probably about the same, but you'll get a lot faster TPS and a lot faster responses. And th these are actually, I, I can't believe I didn't, I didn't think about asking this. So there's basically low end requirements. Can I, are they, can I do GPU optimization with them? So right now we don't support GPU or FPGA mm -hmm. or ARM. So mm -hmm. right now they're on um, just x64 CPU. Mm -hmm. um, we do hear these requests all the time. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to develop our product, we'll move out to these. Fantastic. So a question uh, out here. Do you detect text, uh, text also? It looks like we do. How does your OCR work? Any new language support coming? Yeah. So um, I don't have ETAs on when mm -hmm. new languages are coming, but that is something that our team is actively working on. We, Microsoft's a global company, sure. and all of our customers are often global customers, whether it's a customer from a different country or whether it's a customer that also deploys all over the world. We know that there is a need to make this world smaller and to understand many different languages, and so we are working on that. Awesome. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna finish up here, and then we're gonna we're gonna come uh, to the next session right after this. A couple of questions before we do that. To get started with containers, you go to the form and you fill it out. Uh, can you can you bring that one up again? Yeah. So I want people to make sure to. So how how when is this? When can people just start using this in a general, uh, generally available way? So we don't have an ETA for general availability. Um, we'll probably have uh, signups for a little while, mm -hmm. but we are actively listening to your signups, reviewing them, and getting back to you as soon as we can. Fantastic. Um, so to use containers, start with aka.ms slash vision containers preview, okay. or check out our documentation. Um, custom vision logo detection is at customvision.ai. Okay. And all of the rest of our services are at azure.com slash cognitive. Awesome. Well, no excuses. You should be able to use vision starting now. You can actually go and try it on the website. If you go to azure.com front slash cognitive, you can try all the, the vision stuff right away. Yeah. And if you want to do some of the container stuff, just go on there and, and uh, send us a little note. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be right back after this little break.